This is uh, Dr. Michael Corpy uh, from Baylor University and Dr. Corey Carbonara, uh, also from Baylor University. And they have developed what is called 6P, which is a six color based uh, display technology. And I've asked them to share this content with us uh, as, and also to answer questions about where this is going. Uh, a couple of things I'm thinking in terms of, number one, the technology as it is, how it works backwards in compatibility, if at all, and the implications going forward. But I also want you to pay attention to some of the elements of the process of technological development. Because remember the four themes, technology is one of them. You know, economics, regulation, and programming. Technology is one of the key components. And this is where the, this is an example of how that technology moves forward. So that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and I will turn it over to you two. What's your, uh, my first question, what is 6P? <laughs> Corey. Well, you know, 6P is actually a new way of looking at primaries. In the past, the primaries have been really based on three major primaries um, for the additive color process, and that's red, green, and blue. And so what we have done is we have taken a look at that and added more primaries. And so our original concept was to add the supplementary colors, which were cyan, magenta, and yellow. And when added to the primary colors of red, green, and blue, uh, you would have six total uh, colors rather than three. And uh, that was the way we started the process, but we um, have gone so much further than that. We do have um, a little presentation, if you'd like, we could, uh, we could share with you. Um, and then uh, please know that at any given time, uh, interrupt us, ask questions, uh, step over us. <laughs> Uh, we want this to be as interactive and as, as free form as possible for you so that it's, it's benefiting the students. So um, with that, Mike, do you want me any, any other? Uh, yeah, I, no, I think that's very helpful. We should, because at least seeing the color, the CIE color diagram, and mm -hmm. uh, we need to see that to really explain what's uh, so, going on. So. so Andrew, I need your permission um, to be able to share the screen. Okay, let me see where it says multiple participants can share. Okay, I'm gonna share screen. Let me get to that. Here we go. Okay. You're let engaged. Me, great, let me go ahead and, and set this up uh, with the PowerPoint. And they do understand the RGB basics for a uh, color uh, formation. Oh, okay. okay, good. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, can you see the full screen now of this right here? No, we're seeing the, we're seeing the presenter view. Okay, let me swap the displays then. How about uh, how about now? There we go. Okay, great, great. All right, so let me go ahead and and just uh, kind of start off with uh, the the first slide. Um, one of the things I loved about your introduction to this was the fact that uh, you had said, Andrew, you know, that it's not just the technology; it's also looking at you know the programming it's looking at you know economics and and of course there's other drivers which include socio um cultural aspects as well so <clears throat> color you know is art enabled by by technology and you know one of the reasons we have that first slide up there um that it looks at uh, three iconic pictures is because they all kind of represent um an interesting point in which color had been uh really focused on um and in in, in a very uh, unusual way First one, obviously, we know uh, Wizard of Oz and, of course, Technicolor. The, the second and, and the third um, examples here are really two examples of early digital intermediate processing. And in this particular case, being able to isolate a particular color um, and highlight that color, um, for example, uh, or you know, have the opening sepia tone that you saw in Old Brother War Art Thou, uh, was made possible by uh, a, an interface of digital um, cinema. And that digital cinema was first started as what we call a digital intermediate. Um, the interesting thing about this is, is that uh, these two examples of digital intermediate have two people that are part of our team. One is Stephen Poster, ASC, who happened to do Stuart Little too. So some of your students out there uh, may have watched it at some point in their life, uh, that movie. Um, and uh, if they did, uh, it was one of the earliest movies to, to use digital intermediate. Um, and and uh, was very you know, historically important. The other one, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? 
is is also uh, interesting because Mitch Bogdanovitz, who is um, Dr. Bogdanovitz, was the chief color scientist uh, at um, Kodak and uh, had developed the Cineon technique, which uh, involved BPX files, which of course were files that were made from the digital intermediates so that digitally you can enhance the color. So that's why we say that color is enabled by technology. And what you're gonna to hear today from both Dr. Corpy and I um, really is uh, again, how that actually gets played out. Um, and, and Mike is gonna you know, tag team with me and, and we'll, we'll be doing this together. Um, the old and the new, um, you know, in the old days, and, and Andrew, you know this as well, I mean, there was a point where uh, it was fairly simple. If you wanted color um, in terms of television, uh, you had a colored television camera. That camera had a specification that was uh, very much in tune with the receiver. Um, and in the old analog days, uh, cameras and displays assumed the same color primaries, red, green, and blue, and the same white point. But digital really changed all that. And this was one of the challenges that uh, precipitated really, you know, uh, thinking about uh, moving beyond uh, three primaries to uh, multiple primaries. Um, you know, you have cameras, and they all have different uh, prints, if you will, of, of uh, uh, or imprints of color. That is the way that they analyze the color. That's what I mean when I say prints. I, I just mean the way that they're processing the color. And it's all different. And they, they you know, some have better, uh, you know, coverage in the red or the green area or the blue area. And that doesn't necessarily match up to the receivers or to displays. And so it's a, it's a whole different sort of ball game. This is what uh, Dr. Corpy was talking about when he was talking about the CIE diagram. And one of the most important things I think to look at here is um, how the industry has approached evolving color processing. So if you look at the first inner triangle, and uh, I'll try to, I'm gonna turn my head a second so I can look at the full screen. If you look at this one right here, this is BT-709, it's an international standard. And um, it actually increased the color of the old days of the analog by you know, providing an HDTV uh, color um, that was really uh, allowing for, for 10 times the color fidelity, if you will, of what was seen before. Interestingly enough here, um, the, the cinema, when digital cinema was enacted, uh, had a standard which was called BCI P3, the Digital Cinema Initiative, P3 for, for three primary colors of red, green, and blue. And you can see how much more uh, territory uh, this had in terms of, of color rendition. Um, the latest evolution has been uh, this BT um, 2020, REC 2020, and it's looking at really extending uh, color. Now, by the way, this, this really imprint that you're seeing of color, this map is what God has given us to see color. I mean, this is the human color visual system. This is what God intended us to see. And, you know, even with the, the most interesting and latest uh, target of 2020, which by the way, has not been achieved. I mean, we're getting closer. We're seeing some developments that are trying to get there. Laser projection is one of them, um, but nobody has really received 100% of that territory yet. And, and even perceived it. So it's, it's fascinating to see what happens. And so from our perspective, we're interested in what happens when you add an additional color and you move, let's say a cyan, for example, just one, and you start to move it out here, you can see how much more territory in the, especially in the green and red area that you get by extending another primary out here. And, and that really is kind of the basis. So for us, we extended a, a primary out this way. We had another primary that took care of a little bit of a gap here in yellow. And of course, we had another primary that would be along this line, which would be in the magenta area. And, and that's how we started it. And, and why did we start it? Because there were technical challenges. Um, cameras you know, have the color capability to go way beyond what the triangles are showing you in that, in that uh, slide that we just had up there. Um, they, they can go beyond these current gamuts. By the way, you know, just uh, to, to go back a second, these are all called gamuts uh, when you start to look at the, the, the tracking of these three primaries. Um, and so cameras have the color capabilities that could weigh out there, but no one has uh, been able to, to really uh, yield those uh, and work with them. Um, set lighting. Can you go? Can you yeah. show that again? The CIE diagram. Sure. Just I just want to point out uh, something. One, that as those areas go from the Rec 709 to P3 to Rec 2020, if you're using the same bit depth, 
you know, if you have eight bits, you've got 256 possibilities, 256 steps for each color, red, green, and blue. You got 10 bits, you get 1,024. And if, you know, you go to 12 bit, which nobody's doing right now, 4096. Okay, but if they have the same, if you've got 10 bit in Rec 709 and P3, then you have bigger steps from the primary to the white point. You you have the same number of steps, but they're bigger. So your accuracy of reproducing color goes down as you increase this gamut if your bit depth stays the same. So what you're saying is that it's less like an incline and more like stair steps. Yes. And particularly for uh, you know vitally important color adjustments like flesh tone, you're going to have less accurate control over flesh tones so with REC not, 2020. Yeah. It's not a true yeah. gradient then. Right. Uh, so that's one of the disadvantages. And the other disadvantage is in order to get these primaries out here to the locus, this this outside line, the curve that curves around, those are all the colors of uh, the rainbow. And that's their fully saturated state. There isn't any color beyond that. You can't see anything beyond that. That's the fully saturated state. In the older technologies, we couldn't really get out to that fully saturated state because our primaries were wider bandwidth. So television, Rec 709, isn't out to the edge and uh, NTSC television before that wasn't. Now we're getting to where we can push some things out there, especially with lasers and some LEDs. But the downside is those are very, very narrow bandwidth. So from the range of the rainbow, all the colors of the rainbow, then those primaries are very narrow. There are huge gaps in the frequencies where you don't see anything. Mm -hmm not on the display. And that can cause major problems uh, in, in production. So I just wanted to point those out. And then one other thing is there's no way that you can use um, primaries on a display have to be within the CIE diagram, okay? And there's no way that you can cover all of the CIE diagram that is everything God you know, created us to see, you can never cover that with a triangle. Right. You, you can always leave out some significant bit. And so if you add another primary, then you can cover quite a bit more, maybe five, maybe go four primaries or five, six, you can go above that. And then it's just a question of, is that practical or not? The magenta color, um, We've kind of abandoned our, we'll still experiment some with magenta, but magenta is not really a color. It's not a color of the rainbow. It's a color your brain tells you that you're seeing, but there is no frequency associated with magenta or pinks or whatever. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's just a mixture of red and blue. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton spent a good bit of time, you know, cogitating about that. Like, why is that? Why am I seeing magenta? And it's not in the spectrum when I use the prism to break up white light. Uh, so yeah, that was a that was a big question back then. But it's not a real, it's not a color of the rainbow. Okay. Okay. That's all my. No, it's real good, uh, Mike. That's excellent. You know, and and really, let's translate a little bit more in terms of the technical challenges. So now you even understand a little bit more based on on uh, Michael's addition that. Um, you know, we've got things now where we're mixing set lighting that's LED and we're mi mixing that and, and, and it's, you know, having, having spectrum issues with limitations on these three primaries with cameras who do not see those colors the same way. And we've added the virtual production now. The virtual production uh, element is where you have emissive LED walls that are used like in the Mandalorian, for example, um, to replace uh, being on location. And they're limited by, again, what the three stimulus colors of red, green, and blue are, are being portrayed, you know, on the screen itself. And, and they, you know, have um, major issues that have come up. Um, the limitation of that uh, RGB process has uh, really begun to, to become very clear uh, in terms of challenges of being able to reproduce flesh tones, for example, accurately. Right. I mean, imagine you see that scene of the desert. 
And if you're actors, if you were really in the desert, the light coming from all that sand in the sky and would be falling on the actors and uh, that would have a spectral distribution all the way from the deepest, you know, purple uh, to the deepest reds. But the wall, which, okay, that looks like a desert, but that's just a bunch of red, green, and blue lights right. that have very, very narrow bandwidth with no light in between, no frequencies in between. If just imagine setting up some separate red, green, and blue lights behind the actors and shining that on them, well, that would cause problems, which is exactly what it does. Yeah, and this is why, you know, as Dr. Corpy is saying right now, with only three primaries, he mentioned this, we'll never be able to achieve the images that match the world that we see. And this is what cinematographers like Stephen Poster, ASC, uh, 70 different, you know, films to his credit. Um, we talked about him a little bit with just one of the films, you know, Stuart Little 2, um, but multi-primaries for him, at least, is like moving from stereo to surround sound. Um, uh, okay. Can I throw in a question here then? Sure. And, uh, I'm sure you've dealt with it. Uh, how, if we are built with red, green, and blue cones, <clears throat> and perceptually, mm -hmm. how do they, our eyes, see between the cracks? And how, is that how does that work with this? Sure, we're going to go back and we're going to take uh, the the image that we just had before to kind of kind of illustrate that, right? So there's three major um, areas. There's a green area, there's a red area, and there's a blue area, right? So what happens is the combination of the you know ability from the eye standpoint with the cones to be able to mix those frequencies. In other words, find where the frequencies are in between those areas. Uh, processing can occur. That's why God is allowing us to see some pretty interesting yellows and some cyans over here, right? And even though we're mixing two colors um, of the rainbow to get uh, purple, we, we, we do get stimulus with good color rendition in our eyes with no, no problems of color blindness. You know, we do have that ability to do it, even though we're, we're you know, limited to what the exactly what the exact map is of the major frequencies of red green and blue so yeah, the brain we... kind of extrapolates the color yes 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 mm -hmm. and it is we don't have the um comparison of the two sensitivity curves in this presentation do we no not in this one okay um everybody's um uh, every human being's sensitivity to light across the spectrum varies mm. uh, varies minute, to some I degree. Can, I can take care of that. Hold on. I think we do. Let me get uh, let me get this because that's a that's the best way to show the what the problem is with the narrow bandwidth. Yeah, let me there go. We go. Yeah, let me get uh, I'll get this off. I'll, I'll take the height side off. We'll go back. There we go. OK, should see it now. OK, so the curve the purple curve and the orange curve, that represents uh, a hypothetical sensitivity of the human visual system to light across the spectrum, okay? Uh, and that curve is the same in both of those graphs, but it's just been shifted to the right in the second one, okay? Just to illustrate, okay, here's the sense, these people have a slightly different sensitivity. The curves could vary too, right? But for our purposes, uh, this is perfect. Those spikes of blue, green, and red, that's what you would get from a laser projector. Uh, and it's very narrow, and there's no light in between. So if you're trying to recreate a color, you can send the same signal, the same amount of red, green, blue to person A and person B, observer A, observer B. And the only the only signal that's going to go down their optic nerve is the number of photons from the blue light source that they perceived that crosses over their, that sensitivity curve where the blue arrow is on the left and the green arrow and the red arrow. That combination of red, green, and blue is what gets sent to their brain. But observer B is seeing a completely different combination of blue, green, and red because they're only getting light energy in that one spike for each of those primaries. Now that's called metameric error. When you're trying to show a specific color and two people see 
two completely different colors. Michael, re relate to them, um, you know, what happens with colorists, because that's a good story. Uh, yes, my, uh, my youngest son is an assistant colorist for Company 3, and Company 3 is, has a number of locations, but the biggest one is in Los Angeles, and uh, that's where he... Hey, let me works. add here, a, a colorist is someone who does the final uh, application and adjustments of colors in a, in a film production, correct? Right. Okay. So they don't. They do all the Marvel movies. They did the 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 latest Star Wars movies. Um, and one of the things they have to do is they grade. They'll grade the movie color for normal projection. And then the last thing they do is they do a version for the Dolby laser projectors in the really high end theaters. But the problem is the laser projectors have a light distribution like I'm showing you here. Uh, another downside of that is that those lasers have to be very, very high powered in order to put out enough light because you're only, it's, you know, you're only sensing it in that one little narrow bandwidth. So it has to be very, very high power. Um, but on numerous occasions when they're grading this final laser projection version, they found that even the colorists can't agree mm -hmm. on what the color is. So my son was in the room when they had the colorist that was finished. They watched it through. He brought in one or two other colorists to look at it. They all agreed, okay, this looks good. And then the colorist who founded the company came in and said, what's the matter with you people? It's all green, everything's, everything's green. I'll just fix it. What's the matter with you guys? He sits down, says, okay, that's now that's all fixed. And he leaves. They look at it and they're going, magenta? Yeah, magenta. They all saw it as magenta. Everything was slightly magenta. So it was it was just the perception, the different sensitivity of the eye. And even to professionals who that's their business is to being very accurate with the color. So yeah, and, and to pick up on that too, you know, this is what happens when you start to push those primary positions outward and you know have to do that by increased saturation of color. Um, when you do that and you have a very narrow frequency, as as Dr. Corpy was mentioning, you know, you're you're really setting yourself up for some metameric problems. And so that, you know, was part of what we were trying to solve. Um, you know, the current systems that are out there are complicated, um, even the use now of lasers for uh, projection systems. Um, you know, there's multiple standards that are out there, as we were even showing you three different triangles. There's incompatibilities, multiple legacy methods. So our approach when we started was to develop a wider gamut, of, you know, display approach instead of these narrow bandwidths that can cause these metameric errors and, and no one you know, would see the same color. So in this particular illustration, as you're looking at it, you'll see that what we were able to do, and I'm gonna turn my head just a second so I can use the pointer here. Um, this right here is the target of um, a, a, an actual development that we're doing right now for an LED wall by adding one more additional primary, which in this case is a cyan primary. And when you see this, uh, you know, in terms of the shape, it's no longer a triangle. And you begin to look at the area that opens up, you know, really from, from what you'd see in a motion picture standard, which is the DCI-P3, to where we are in terms of what we're doing with our wall. Um, you know, there's a lot of territory that it's opened up in terms of, of you know, what this does. So instead of you know, using the triangle, we expand the number of color primaries. This is just an example with adding one um, while keeping their bandwidth as, as wide as possible. The system, the 6P system, Andrew, that you asked us like, okay, what is 6P? Well, we like to think of it you know, as a lens to the lens color encoding process, which means we have photons, as Dr. Corby explained, you know, these photons go through the lens, they get you know, attached to a, sen a sensor that registers them and then through the process, it comes back out of a display to our lens. And so we, we like to think of this as a lens to lens color encoding process. Now there have been attempts by other people to 
you know, improve the number or increase the number of primaries before. I mean, we had Sharp with their Quatron system, which added a yellow a few years back. Um, there have been um, some patent applications by Sony and others for looking at a new camera approach that could use multiple color um, sensors that would go beyond uh, just three primaries. But we wanted to really think of this, you know, from the standpoint of a true system, an end and independent device, independent color um, encoding system. And so we provide for expanded color gamut volume by the way that we're handling it. And we do that by allowing for that process to, to focus on capture, transmission, storage, and display. However, you know, using Roger's diffusion of innovations and beginning to look at the attributes of what constitute uh, true um, adoption, we knew that we had to not increase the complexity, that we had to, in fact, really make this very simple. We also had to um, have backwards compatibility with what was going on in the industry right now. We needed to show a relative advantage of what happens when you add an additional primary or two or three or more. And at the same time, you know, provide a demonstration so people would have a chance to observe it. And we would then continue to provide trialability by inviting others to join um, their efforts with us. And so we've done that. And, and we, we've had a, a situation where the components um, that we're doing and how we're processing reduce that complexity. They reduce the metameric error. They allowed for um, extension to lots of different future systems that go beyond even six in terms of the amount of choice, uh, choices you can make for color primaries and some backwards compatibility with the existing systems. So, um, you know, one of the uh, fun things for us has been um, looking and, and patenting areas of application. We do have our own camera designs, although we're not in the business of making a camera. We do have some camera designs, though, that we've come up with. We certainly have uh, enabled conversion um, in and out of existing color gamuts. Um, and we have file format modifications that we've been able to make. We have a, a very solid workflow design. Um, a transport um, that has uh, been uh, initiated that is working. Um, we can go from RGB, for example, and process it as six colors if we wanted to, and then take the return trip and go back from six colors back to RGB. And, um, you know, really established at least the guidelines for a display that um, is, you know, has a greater color gamut or, or saturation. Um, more than RGB. And we did that um, first with a projection system. We took some uh, Christie projectors and we modified um, pro you know, a, a number of those projectors in order to is a brand. be able to, to do that. What's that? I was saying Christie is a brand of projectors. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a brand of projectors that you would see in a motion picture theater. So Andrew, what we did in, in one, one instance is we, we utilized an RGB projector we uh, modified that RGB projector because we were gonna add another projector that would just pass a cyan uh, filter or a filtration of cyan color through it. Wow. And when you do that, um, you have to compensate for the white because you're now pushing it to the blue green area. You've gotta be able to you know, have enough red to counter that move so that the white stays white, right? So you reduce the cyan, if you will, um, in the uh, typical RGB process. And we did that. And we were able to really show some amazing differences. In fact, we, we started some research on that with our students. Um, and it, there, there was an awe factor that, uh, that we found um, that we were able to test. So, you know, here is, is really what we're saying in essence, our, our multi-primary design, which is more than three. When we say multi-primary, we're talking about more than RGB. They're compatible with, with current practices. If you look at the industry, um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences developed something called ACES, which was the Academy uh, Color Encoding System. And we are compatible with that. In fact, we have developed a, a way, a method of being able to increase the amount of color palette capabilities that a colorist and a director of photography, a director would have um, and these conversions um, between the plot points that created ACES in the first place, going back and forth into you know various standards, um, you know have been worked out by our team, and we right. have conversions there. Yeah, I just like to say in regards to this display, I said before that there aren't any colors that you can see outside of the 
locus, the curve of that CIE diagram. And now on this chart, you're looking at Sony S gamut, and Airy AWG uh, gamut is the green and the red. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they have primaries outside of CIE, but cameras don't have primaries. They have filters, they capture photons. Oop, they're, they're capturing photons from within, you know, what the human range can see. They also can ca capture some at infrared, down past red and ultraviolet, but they're capturing photons in that whole range, which is one of the reasons we don't need to invent a new camera in order to make multi-primary work because cameras that are capturing in the raw format already have data. They're capturing right. photons that are outside of the gamut of your display. And we can use those. We can just tap into it. So they're, they're in a sense backwards ca compatible to start with. The triangles you see, the, uh, the green and the red triangles in particular, those are associated with cameras. Those are just mathematical constructs. Mm -hmm. That's a mathematical choice they make for how they're going to calculate what colors they're going to show you within the gamut of your display. Okay. So they're not real primaries. They're like virtual primaries. The colors don't exist out there, uh, but you can do the math with those numbers and the math works. Yeah, you know, Michael's making a really great point here because if you start looking at changing the shape of this geometric approach from a triangle and, and change it so that you put a cyan out in this area, you have more color now that you can process. And we haven't done anything to the cameras. You know, we just right. are, are, are having a mechanism now to be able to utilize that color. Yeah, because you might look at this and say, oh, well, look at that blue, that uh, ACES AP0 looks like that triangle covers everything human beings can see. Why don't we just use that? Why don't we just use that? Well, one of the reasons, the most important reason is you can't make display primaries that are like that. Display primaries have to be visible. Mm -hmm. So they have to be within the CIE diagram. And the other reason not to do it is that you're wasting a lot of your uh, digital steps out here in areas that don't have any color. There's no color out there. So you're just wasting your bit depth out there. Uh, but the most important reason is you can't make display primaries outside of the CIE diagram. Right, right. So with our partnership, we were able to actually um, develop a mechanism so that we could uh, color in areas that were beyond the, the typical triangles. And we did develop a six primary color authoring um, tool in conjunction with Assimilate Scratch, which is our partner here. You see the Assimilate logo. Um, and, and one of the things we were concerned about, you know, from an artistic standpoint and being colorists ourselves and, you know, being in the production side, um, you know, you don't really want to have to try to juggle six trackballs. That's, that's a little tough for a colorist. They're used to three. Um, so, you know, that helped us recognize that we could even begin to think of a new method or a new concept for handling these additional colors and do it in such a way that we could um, place it within the realm uh, of the existing uh, three handles, if you will, that uh, colorists are used to. And, and we developed a new system called cap Y little x little y to do that. And we'll talk about that in, in just a, a minute or two. Um, we, we did, uh, again, work with another company, Video Clarity, to build a box that can ingest um, and transfer from RGB to RGB CY, uh, CMY if we wanted, um, and then back and return trips. So, so you know, we're, we're working with partnerships in order to do this, but uh, one of the big breakthroughs that we, because in order to do this, in order to, to, to process this, because things are used to three, three particular compartments to process color, um, you know, we, we went and rethought this again. And our, our brain trust, if you will, came up with a, a very different way of handling this rather than just increasing the number of slots of colors, you know, the number of, of elements that way. And that was a colorimetric approach. And by using math um, and, and be, being able to conform the image now to a plot point, I'm gonna turn my head so I can see this a little bit more and, and use the pointer once again, 
um, you know, you can do a couple of things. Number one, this cap Y right here um, is a very elegant way for us to just talk about the black and white channel, talk about the blackest black and the whitest white and the grays that are in between, and let that channel, this Y, this first channel, become what we call the luminance channel that will tell us information about the shade, the tone, you know, uh, the, the quality of what the, the gray level is, black or white. Color then is defined as a coordinate and, and not as a color. So as you can see here, here you can plot where the X point and the Y point would be. And since it has no black and white information that we have to worry about, um, it allows us to be able to very efficiently work in a number of different systems uh, that you know go beyond the highest level of quality, which would be a 444 or 4444 system, um, which is going to be used by Pixar or is going to be used you know, for the um, advanced color rendition and quality control and, and, and shaping and, and you know, um, color, color um, uh, processing that would be done by a colorist in Hollywood. But and these... the most, yeah, the most important part about this is that it, it decouples our system from yeah. particular primaries. We don't care how many primaries there are. That can be, that's at the very end in the display. Yeah. So think about it. Think about those three triangles here within the CIE diagram. Um, those systems, every system we've had prior to this with film or video or photography has been, if it's color, it's been three primaries. And so the question is, where's the red? Where's the green? Where's the blue? Mm -hmm. That defines the triangle. And then we, we determine, we can specify a color by uh, only one you know, one point of color is one set of values. So much red, so much green, so much blue. There's only one solution for each location, right? And so that whole standard is built around that. And then when... Oh, I think he froze. Yeah. Uh, um, can, yes. Uh, so this seems somewhat similar of all things uh, to a GUI or a mouse, which is basically based on a coordinate on a screen. Is that what yeah. you're saying? That it pulls a point based on a coordinate point off your larger color palette. Right, right. And that's a good analogy. Another one I like to do is like, um, how many of the students there in, in your presence uh, have played the, uh, the game Battleship? Most yeah, of okay. over half. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So think of the grid, right? Battleship grid. So now we, we have a coordinate and we're looking at this sector right here and we're, we're plotting that in terms of where that energy is. And then we've got the, another, the next plot of where the energy is in terms of where its location is. Its distance from the white point would be here. And the point that you know we're making with regards to this approach is that we, we don't have a lot of payload, right, that me makes this very, very, very large in terms of processing, because we're not processing the black and white in all three channels, as Dr. Corpy said. Oh, he's back. Good, good job. Yeah, I think it's working. I don't. Yeah, yeah, no, you're there. You're there now. Okay. Okay. So this allows us to put it um, and utilize this with any type of device, any type of device that has a camera or has a display, right? So 422 and 420 means that, there, you know, we, we can do color processing um, and open up the, the gambit of, of utility for, for lots of devices. Anything else you want to say on this slide, uh, Michael? Oh, I just wanted to explain how it's decoupled from the primaries. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like trying to describe uh, where your hometown is by saying uh, it's so many miles from Miami, it's so many miles from New York mm -hmm. City, it's so many miles from Chicago. That works if you're within that triangle. If you're outside of that, well, then you need a bigger triangle. Right. And if you have two different systems for describing a location, then you have to be able to convert from one to the other. It's complicated. We, you avoid all of that if you just use latitude and longitude to identify your location, which is essentially what we're doing here. Yeah. No, that's a really good analogy and, and, and good example. And, you know, this is just a summary slide. So with these, you know, the fact that we're just still using three descriptors similar to RGB, 
There's no changes to transport. You can see the processing is a lot simpler. The conversion now uh, between SDR and HDR, which is very, very you know important, um, you know, is is simpler. And, okay, and then, uh, SDR and HDR, please. Sure. What is that? Yeah. So high dynamic range, you know, and and really uh, a standard dynamic range. This this is this is where we're looking at uh, how bright the whitest white would be, for example, in the image compared to the darkest black that you would have in the processing. So contrast ratios. Contrast ratio is a part of that, yeah, and and it, it has to do really with the way in which the image then is stepped along a pole, if you will. It's called a Mansell. Uh, approach and you know we we would be able to have lots of demarcation and and um, we would be able to uh, extend um, you know the the brightest uh, imaging uh, possible in HDR and a lot of people who are gamers I don't know if you have any people who who do uh, play video games in the audience but some people have bought um, 4K displays like UHD displays and like to play games and you know utilizing the hdr it's just a, a, a much better experience overall because you have more robustness in the luminance which is black and white and you have greater um, volume in terms of the of the color so uh so our conversions back and forth are, are much simpler and any number of primaries can be displayed with just no increase now in data payload that was a huge breakthrough yeah. for us and, oh, and gamers, if there's any gamers in that are watching this at all, um, you know that latency kills. So uh, simple calculation of using the math to do the plot point like longitude and, and, and latitude, like Dr. Corpy said, is a simple calculation that allows for very low latency, but an enhanced visual experience of the game itself or the movie. Okay, it's now one o'clock. We've got about 20 minutes before class ends, uh, 20 to 30 right. minutes. So I was just giving you a... Yeah, no problem. So let's let's do this a little quicker if and then we'll get to questions. And so I think we could wrap this part up in a couple of minutes by saying I think everybody's getting the point. Um, you know, one of the things that we just mentioned was our approach um, is different than the approach that would have been uh, a cap XYZ approach, because in that approach, um, luminance has to be in every one of the channels. So but we can convert very easily uh, in our system back to a high-end uh, digital processing approach that would be done by Pixar, for example, or ILM. So, so our system you know, is really, ir it's irregardless right now, the display, because it's, it's based on, on sending the um, signals that we have and meet where the display is. And the display will manage the image based on its own limitations. So this can still be sent to RGB uh, systems, uh, you know, but if you happen to have an additional primary like a multi-primary TV or an LED wall that has additional primaries, um, they could take advantage of this very, very easily. Let's just show you really what happens when uh, you start to add primaries. Now, remember, this is, I'm going to turn my head a second. This is again, the, what you're seeing at the theater, this is the theoretical of what happens, right? But let's just say, we were to add a cyan out here at 492. Look how much more territory that you get in a multi-primary system. What happens, and we've done this, we've shown you know, that you get this increased territory both on a projection and on a DV LED uh, environment. Um, if you add a fifth one, like for example, another green, put another green here, here's a green, but we put another one in here, right? Look how much more territory increases just by adding a fifth primary. If we move one more and we add a six primary, although in the two dimension, it doesn't look like we're opening up a lot of territory, we really are in three dimensions. If we looked at this as a 3D model, you would see that this yellow now is right along the locus um, in, oops, sorry. It's right along the locus um, of all, and these are all the points, you know, uh, of, of where human visuals, uh, the human visual system is. And here's the point of this. By this accuracy now, by having a cyan and by having this area open up, uh, everything that moves from here to here is is the flesh area, right? So, so again, you know, again, based on olive scan or any other tonal tonal uh, qualities of scan, we have a, a better accuracy. So this is going to improve the issue that we talked about with virtual production quite a lot. Um, this is, you know, and imagine. I'll let Dr. Corpy take this one. 
Yeah, remember at the beginning I talked about the if you have the same bit depth, uh, that determines how big the steps are. And if you expand the primaries way out, then your steps get bigger. Uh, if it's 8 bit, 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 8th, that's where you hear 16 million colors on your computer monitor are possible. If we just add one primary, the cyan primary, and if we kept it at 8 bit, now we'd have 4.2, 4.3 billion colors versus 16 million. So adding the fourth primary does something else for you as well. Not only do you get more colors outside of the gamut, you get more colors inside the old gamut as well, much finer control over where that individual color is, particularly in flesh tones. We're not working with 8-bit at all. We're working with 10-bit and 12-bit. And if we did uh, six primaries in 10-bit, we're talking about 1.2 quintillion possible <laughs> colors. That's a lot of color. <laughs> so where does this all take this? And so uh, one of the things I think that Dr. Corpy and I had most fun working on was um, theoretically saying, okay, suppose that we had um, 12 lasers or 12 diodes. Uh, we selected these frequencies in order to uh, provide the optimum of matching what God intended us to see in color. Um, and so with these particular 12 at the locations of the frequencies that we that you see on the screen, uh, we can get to 99.13% of the entire human color visual system, which has been really exciting. Our last slide really, you know, and, and really is the fact that um, it's, Andrew, it's been fantastic for us to work with some alums that came from our program. Uh, they, we've had about a dozen people working at NASA uh, one of them uh, is in charge of all of the acquisition of imaging that comes from the space station. Prior to that, it was everything that came from the shuttle program. So we entered into a Space Act agreement with NASA. They're very interested in this. And if you can't read it, um, the purpose in Article 2 on the right-hand side says that the Baylor University Department of Film and Digital Media and NASA Johnson Space Center will uh, collaborate to enhance imagery from space to 6 p color using multicolor imaging. Wow. So we're very excited about all that. Congrats. Thank yeah. you. And in addition to the ISS, that, that means the Art Artemis missions, yeah. the moon missions. Mm -hmm. uh, are they, would you be able to pull the stuff off the, uh, off the Hubble and, and process that through this system? Uh, sure. sure. Yeah. To get the enhanced color off the Hubble? Yeah, I don't. It, yes. The simple answer is yes it would depend on exactly what the sensors are, you know, how we processed it, but yes. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about, uh, uh, about you mentioned, although, uh, how do I put it? Okay, mm -hmm. using the plot pointing system, uh, I, you were talking about the, uh, I mentioned color uh, contrast ratios, that's where I'm going. Okay, if they can see 99.13% of what the human eye can see, does that mean we're also getting closer to the thousand to one contrast ratio of the human eye? Well, we're the HDR. HDR is already to that point and beyond. Oh, really? Okay. In that, you know, if you're you look at some of the demos and you you want your sunglasses, you know, if you've got a if you're sitting down in front of a display and you've got to put sunglasses on, mm -hmm. then You've got a pretty, pretty right, product. right, because it's yes, your the iris of your eye is stopping down, but it's stopping down to a uncomfortable place, right? So, I think we've already reached, we've already reached kind of the limits of that, okay. um, and frankly, in especially for movies, the brighter you make the screen, the brighter you make the room, and one of the features of a movie is the room is dark. Right. So you can't you can't go too bright without ruining that. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? Now yeah. on the other on the other hand, you got a really bright display. We can just put it outside in full sunlight and it'll be fine. Right. Which is something you might want on your phone. Right. You want to be able to see everything just fine when it's in full sunlight. Okay. Uh y'all have questions. Process. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting information. 
<laughs> the processing. Was, the, the slide was very, I mean, everything was very clear. So I'm just like. Okay. Um, I saw as I was uh, reviewing some other stuff uh, that earlier interview, implications for cinematography, you've discussed signage. Uh, and then applications beyond entertainment. You mentioned uh, doctors, you know, who are doing surgery via telemedicine. They would be able to see those extremely subtle differences in tissue. Oh and, yeah, you know the and other the, applications. Right. You know. Well, yes. You, you're medical, obviously, for flesh tone and and being able to look at lesions and things of that nature. What color are they? Um, you know, uh, geographic information systems or GIS. Um, you know. Anything that requires um, really looking at color spectrally that can provide more differentiation, even AR, for example, if you're talking about a car, a heads up display in a car, mm -hmm. you know, we could um, begin to look at adaptation based on uh, what the colors are uh, coming, uh, you know, on the road so that, you know, the true opposite of that or, or a way of being able to contrast that enough with color separation can be clear so that you can have a mapping of AR data on it, for example. Is that based on kind of a visual Doppler effect? Uh, well, yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, that's one. Uh, I think the other one is just, you know, being able to look at AR and VR applications and begin to say, you know, how much, you know, is it worth to have more accurate color? And if you're training or doing a simulation, um, color becomes important in certain business applications and, and uh, training applications. So that's there too. Yeah, okay. ideally, I mean, ideally, we'd want VR to be indistinguishable from real. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's where, you know, that's the ultimate goal. We're quite a ways away from that, but every time you get closer, it's seen as a benefit, right? Now, uh, I'm going to kind of be a devil's advocate on this. I remember when uh, Toy Story was first released. There was, in the from what I understand, this may be urban myth. I don't know our uh, movie myth, but they said the characters were so realistic, they had to take them down a notch because it would have been a little bit too much for the viewers, uh, you know, for, to experience, they still need to see it as animation. Are we gonna be seeing if this is incorporated into the VR world and yeah, what, AR for that matter? Yeah, what you're referring to too is the Uncanny Valley. Um, you know, if you look at photorealism versus stylization, that's that's part of what they're you know they they ran into, uh, in terms of trying to make uh, a decision as to how to keep the characters lovable, but not get them to the point of of being so realistically looking that uh, we tend to look at the, you know five or six percent that's different and then there's something queasy about it there's something that's odd about it, um, so yeah the uncanny valley is something that's that's you know very interesting, um, but animators right. I think they're very excited about the potential of being able to move to areas of color that have not heretofore been actually seen on a display and, and uh, they can go out there because they're in animation. Um, Cyan turns out to have some very interesting uh, applications emotionally to people. And so, um, you know, one of the things about it could also be can color be used as a treatment for PTSD, for example? You know, is there a way in which, you know, color and, and color um, approaches to this uh, can, can be therapeutic or can we, you know, enhance the method in which we tell stories um, by, by use of color? That's the things that we're really interested in. We also are doing research, uh, Mike and I right now, on high frame rate. You know, what is the optimum frame rate for storytelling? Is it 120 frames, 60 frames, 24 frames, 30 frames? And what does the suspension of disbelief really mean? And uh, what does it mean in terms of lighting? And, and so you talked about the light. That's another area, too, because, you know, when you have your iris all the way open and you're in a, a, a theater where you have about 48 to maybe 62 nits that you're working on, these are just measurements of light. Um, that's different than an HDR environment where you might have hundreds or thousands, or in Michael's case, you know, even hitting, you know, tens of thousands in some, some instances. That certainly is a whole different experience to filmmaking. And the frame rate, the frame rate thing, there's, um, you need to be over 2,000 frames per second. We know that. We don't know exactly how many 
frames per second, you need to make it indistinguishable from reality. But people can tell the difference between real and the frame rate presented content up up to two thousand hertz. Yeah, that's wow. a lot of that's a lot of frames. So are you and but because of the compression, uh, the simplicity, if you will, of the data, it can be rapidly processed and mm -hmm. therefore incorporated, let's say, into a, a, a goggles, you know, to the uh, yeah that you would wear in a VR situation. Right. And the, the biggest advantage, like it is in uh, for gamers where they want the highest frame rate possible, it's because they move their point of view. They can move their point of view rapidly and the background needs to not strobe when they do that that it needs enough frames so that all the motion even way in the background is smooth that's a similar thing in vr you can move your head very quickly in vr mm -hmm. uh, and then that's where you would see the problems with low frame rates well um let me uh when we when i was out at baylor uh about a year and a half ago, two years, I don't know, pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in other words, a, a lifetime ago, um, we were talking about the uh, extrapolation of virtual camera position and coverage of sports. Would this type of processing allow for live uh, extrapolation, you know, making that virtual camera based on uh, set camera positions? Would that, does that have potential there? Well, it's certainly, it's, um, it, it's not any more difficult than doing it with RGB. And uh, the frame rate, okay, that's going to affect bandwidth some, but the calculations are going to be the same kind of calculations. Right. So that's just a Moore's law uh, yeah. solution. You know, if, if, it, if it's not capable of doing it now, it will be in 18 months, you know. I just don't put my textbook on sports production out of date before I even write it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We'll try. <laughs> okay. We'll keep that. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, is, is there anything else? Okay. Uh, a final word from each of you uh, that you that you see going forward. Uh, you know, for me, I, I think it's it's the inquiry that we're most interested in about what happens. Um, as we experience and, and tell stories and find new ways and, and different ways to tell stories. I think the fact that cinematographers who are artists are very encouraged by this, colorists are very encouraged by this. Um, you know, color can be a, a, an, another new method if we just don't hinge this on a, on a teepee, you know, on a, on a triangle, right? And we start opening it up, I think that's gonna be good. I think the last point is just for me, um, there is a new field um, that really has to do with the building and, and blending psychology with cinema. And um, psychocinematics is an interesting field because of how the brain processes images. And so I think uh, more research is needed and we're excited uh, about crossing over the silos to do that with uh, different departments like psychology. Mike? Yeah, I mean, we're working on this because we think it's fun. You know, it's fun, it's fun and it's interesting. And frankly, it's just our opinion that we think color, color is where you're gonna in, improve images the most. We're, we're uh, more pixels is not what we need now. So you can get an 8K display and you can't tell the difference from a 4K display and you, unless you use a magnifying glass and go stand right in front of it. Uh, so that's, you know, the point of diminishing returns. If we're gonna increase the quality and the, the you know, the engagement we have with images has got to be in color, is our opinion. And we think that we can basically stir things up enough, at least with what we've done to kind of make that happen sooner, whether it's our system or not, you know, just the fact that we're doing it makes it much more likely that the thing will happen. I think Marshall McLuhan would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Andrew. Oh, it's so good to see you and be with your, your students. Good to have you all here. Uh, thank you so much. Very informative and challenging, uh, you know, in terms of how we look at color and how we look at uh, color processing. And I'll go ahead and sign off for us here. Thank you very much. And uh, mm -hmm. let's stay in touch. All right. We're happy Sounds to good. have done. Thank you. Okay. okay. Sigum Bears. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go.